Children, please come forward. So glad you guys are here today. Young, old, anybody who wants to come up here is welcome to come up here. Oh. Great. Come on down. Hey. Yay. I'm so glad you guys are here because every week you need, I need, we all need that reminder that God loves us. And this is a good place to remember that. And take that into the week to, uh, to come and look back and see how God was a part of our lives in the week before. Speaking of the week before, did you have a good Halloween? It's like a week ago now we had a Halloween. Did you, did you get a lot of candy? Did you do that? Okay, good. Still working on it? The candy or is it all gone? It's kind of all gone probably by this point, isn't it? Did you get scared at any point? The Halloween? Sort of? No? Eh, kind of? No? Well, here's a question for you, and not just for you, but for everybody. What are you afraid of? I think everybody's afraid of something. What's something that you're afraid of? Maybe it's something like spiders or snakes or something. Or is there anything you're afraid of? Probably do, but don't want to share it, and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I can tell you one thing that I'm afraid of, and that is the dark. I don't like the dark. I don't, yeah. Huh? Uh, in fact, when I was a kid, it was, it was a specific place in the dark. The basement. I hated the basement of our house because it was down and it was dark and it was weird down there. I didn't like it at all down there. And so there was a time one day my mom asked me to go get something from the basement for her. And it was dark down there. I don't want to go down there. I'm not going down there. Because in our house, the, the light switch for the basement was at the bottom of the stairs. So I asked my dad, I said, could you go down before me, go, go ahead of me, and go down and turn the light on? And he said, sure. So he went down the stairs, turned the light on, and then I went down, did what I needed to do down there, and came back up. He came back up with me. So it worked out. And I've always remembered that, because it kind of reminds me of what Jesus does for us in the scary times of our lives. In the scary times when we feel scared or we feel angry or we feel sad or we feel frustrated or whatever it is that we're dealing with in our lives that's really hard to go through, Jesus goes down into that dark place ahead of us and turns the light on. 
and stays down there with us till we get done what we need to get done and then comes with us. I think that's a really a powerful thing to remember, that we don't face any of those dark times by ourselves. Jesus goes ahead of us, goes down there before us and turns the light on and stays with us in the hard times of life to remind us that we're never alone, never alone, no matter how hard things might get. God is always there with us each step of the way. And God's light can guide us and make us feel a little more safe, a little more assured that we're going to be all right. We're going to be okay because we're not alone. So I hope you remember that. Next time you're facing something really hard, something frustrating or angering or, or sad or whatever it is, that you're not alone. God goes before you in Jesus Christ to turn the light on, so, to remind you that you're not alone and you're going to be okay. All right. You can go sit back with your families. We're going to share the sacrament of Holy Communion. Just highlighting a few announcements uh, this morning. They're all there in your bulletin. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, this fall and has been and will be coming up. Um, the youth, middle school and high school youth, next Sunday uh, will be raking leaves at uh, some of our homebound members. Uh, so that's always a, a, a nice annual event for our uh, youth group. Uh, if you want to join in with cleanup, that's later in the month here, the uh, fall cleanup here at our church on the 19th, Saturday. Uh, in the narthex, you can find out more this morning about uh, the, uh, the uh, pie coffee hour, Thanksgiving pie coffee hour uh, that uh, Donna mentioned, as well as abundant information about how you can help with the Christmas fair, the Winter Wonderland Christmas fair that's coming up the first part of December, which sneaks up rather quickly. So uh, there's a number of ways that you can help out, uh, small ways, big ways, in between ways, plug in, because it's, 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 it's a great way to... Uh, uh, to not only help the church as a, as a fundraiser, but to connect with people in the church. Maybe meet some new people uh, here at First Congregational that you may not know, and, and just hang out together doing a good thing. So uh, check out that announcement. There's some good ideas here. There's some information in the Narthex about that as well. Uh, information about Servant's Heart Pantry, and uh, we uh, collect uh, for Servant's Heart every first Sunday of the month on Communion Sundays. But hey, we'll take those donations anytime, too. So bring them by if you'd like, uh, any, any Sunday or any day during the office hours, a weekday during the office hours here. Information about Bread of Life, we talk about that from time to time. If, if you're new to our church, don't know uh, about that uh, outreach ministry from our church, there you go. There's some information there on how to uh, plug into that. Um, uh, next Sunday after worship, uh, Gary will be sharing... Uh, Gary Lamont will be sharing some information about renewable energy, and uh, that'll be a, a post-worship uh, event here in the sanctuary. Uh, so a lot going on, uh, although today is one of the rare Sundays in our church where we don't have a meeting directly following worship. So you are invited to coffee hour uh, directly following the service in the, in the uh, narthex uh, to, uh, to, uh, to catch up with one another, may, as they say, meet, maybe meet some new folks. Um, and find out more about our church. If you're new to our church, we do encourage you to sign a guest registry in the Narthex and visit that welcome table out there to gather some information about who we are and what we do and what we believe here at First Congregational Church. Um, we got some great momentum going uh, this fall, uh, and we want to keep that going into the new year. So um, we uh, are in the midst of our fall stewardship campaign right now. We've been talking about that in some form or fashion pretty much every Sunday. Uh, since uh, October. Uh, so uh, there is a table also in the Narthex. Chip, I know will be there at that. Uh, one of our deacons of finance uh, to help uh, uh, you fill out what material. If you haven't got a chance to fill out a pledge card yet, he'll have those there. Information about automatic deposits, all that stuff is there. And uh, it's all part of capturing the momentum that we have right now and throwing that into 2023 uh, so that we can still... Uh, go about the work of uh, Christ's uh, joyous energy in this place and communicating that uh, to the wider world. So do visit him. Uh, and right now, as we sing the doxology, consider your giving uh, to the church. The offering plates are at the exits of the sanctuary. Um, and uh, consider how you would like to uh, support uh, the ministries of First Congregational Church now and in the days ahead. Your offering is invited. 
It is a great day to be together, I think. It's so warm out. I feel like we're going into Easter instead of Thanksgiving. This is great. Uh, I've got a scripture passage I'd like to share with you this morning. It's from the lectionary course. Um, kind of an interesting one that uh, Jesus' uh, interaction with uh, uh, a Sadducee. Interesting question he asks. And it goes like this. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a, man, uh, if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her and so on in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore, because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. A lot to think about there. May God uh, bless the reading and the hearing of these holy words. And will you pray with me? Compassionate Creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts bring us into deeper relationship with you, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, you know, throughout Jesus' life and ministry, he was asked some pretty strange questions. But this one, this has got to be among the strangest questions. Who would come up with such a weird set of circumstances for Jesus to comment on? Seven brothers. Each one dies in succession after marrying the same woman. Which one will be married to her in the afterlife? What kind of a question is that? What kind of a question is it? Clearly, I think this was part of some sort of groupthink session some night where the Sadducees were sitting around and they said, well, how are we going to trick up Jesus somehow? And someone said, well, maybe we'll, well, why don't we ask him about, about a, a, a guy who's married to a woman and the guy dies, mother, the brother marries the same woman, and then he dies. And they're like, that's great. That's great. That's good. That's good. But let's, let's stretch it out a little bit more. Let's have another brother do the same thing. And then another brother. They're all dying, but they're marrying to keep marrying the same woman. Let's keep it going. And they said, that's kind of crazy. I don't know. That, that's, that's, I, you know what? If you guys want to do another round, buy another round, I'm out. This is getting too much for me. But they said, okay, we'll settle on that then. Before everybody leaves, that's our question, right? Seven brothers, same woman. We'll see how this goes. All right? But I'm not asking the question. Who's going to ask the question? I'm not asking that question. I said, well, Sean's not here. Well, I have Sean asked the question. Everybody agreed. So Sean, who wasn't there, Sean Sadducee, he, uh, he gets the bad news. He's got to ask Jesus this question. And uh, so he gets the napkin on which this question was written on the meeting the night before, and he goes and finds Jesus, and he says, okay. Now, there were seven brothers. Sorry about this. I wasn't at the meeting. That's not in the scripture, by the way. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her, and also in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, Whose wife will the woman be? How would you answer that? How would you? Am I the only one 
who thinks the right question to ask in return is, did she take out a life insurance policy on each of these guys? I mean, wasn't like the, the fifth husband a little suspicious? There's some things you need to know about the Sadducees. These were men, and they were all men, who were a Jewish religious sect representing the high priests. They dominated the temple and the priesthood at that time, at least until the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. The Sadducees believed that all of God's laws, all of God's divine revelation were contained in the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, which they call the Torah, still call that today, the Torah, which includes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We Christians call those five books the Pentateuch. The Sadducees believe that these five books were the basis of all religious practice. And because there is no mention of any kind of resurrection in those books, they didn't believe in that concept or anything to do with the afterlife. But that only makes this a stranger question. I mean, why worry about who will be married to whom at the resurrection if you don't believe in the resurrection in the first place? Well, because they aren't interested in an answer. They're interested in starting an argument that's going to make Jesus look bad, look foolish in some way. They thought they could trip him up. They thought they could trivialize his teachings. They thought they could dilute his power and his, his uh, uh, popularity uh, with the people. But instead of seeing this as a challenge, Jesus saw it as an opportunity. So he answers the question. Now that alone is no small thing. Because in the New Testament, Jesus is asked 183 questions, and he only answers three of them directly. And this is one of them. So this is important. The reason Jesus so rarely answered questions directly, I think, is because he felt the person was asking the wrong question. The question was too limited. The question was too narrow. It was off track somehow. A major part of Jesus' ministry involved challenging our limited view of God. And this came through in the questions that he was asked and in the way that he answered or didn't answer. Most often, the person asking the question was looking for specifics, a set of rules to live by, something concrete to take away. But Jesus would often answer with another question or with a story of some sort. And he did that because his mission was not to deliver religious rules and regulations, but to expand our view of God. So, this question from the Sadducee is the wrong question. Even our more serious questions from ourselves, questions like, why do people have to die? It's the wrong question. We limit ourselves by the questions we ask, and the questions we ask limit the answers that we get. And we get stuck in a rut doing that. We, we get more and more limited in our, in our thinking. It's kind of like uh, the preschool teacher who asked uh, her class to name an animal that begins with the letter E. And one little boy said, elephant. He said, good, good. Now, what's an animal that begins with the letter T? And the same kid said, two elephants. And she's like, okay, okay, give him another chance, give him another chance. So see if he can come up with another, come up with an animal that begins with the letter M. Well, at that point, his knowledge of animals was kind of at its end, but he wanted to try again. So he hesitated and he said, many elephants. But that happens to us, I think, because we, we limit ourselves by the questions we ask, and the questions we ask limit the answers that we get. Jesus was all about asking the right questions. I believe throughout the, the Gospels, Jesus is trying to say, listen, if you start every religious question that you have 
with the question, what is God like? What if you did that? What if you started every religious question you have with the question, what is God like? If you can get a handle on what God is like, then you have a foundation for understanding every other question you're about to ask. But Jesus does answer this question from the Sadducees directly. He's essentially saying that you're you're applying worldly standards to the life after this life, which is a realm where the only standard is the love of God. Everyone in that realm is a child of God because they are children of the resurrection. And by the way, says Jesus, the resurrection is actually in the Torah, he says. Remember that burning bush story? Even Moses showed that the dead rise, he says, for he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to God all of them are alive. Even though they died a long time ago, to God they are alive. In this wonderful answer, Jesus is challenging our limited view of God, our limited view of God's love for all of us. Stop worrying about these esoteric questions, these hypothetical questions, and know that God's purpose is simply this, your ultimate purpose completeness. God's love and God's care are so much greater, so much greater than the categories you live by. They are children of God since they are children of the resurrection. God loves us with a relentless commitment, the relentless commitment of a loving parent. And it is without bound And it never ends. On the surface, this this Bible uh, story for today is about death and the afterlife. But in reality, it's about the limits that we place on God. One of the greatest tasks of our faith, I believe, is to shatter those limits. And it starts by asking the right questions. And a good place to begin is to ask, before anything else... What is God like? When we do that, we will immediately be given a glimpse of the infinite vastness of God's incomparable love and companionship with us in this life and in the life to come. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we thank you for this opportunity to draw closer to you through the sacrament of Holy Communion this morning, and in our ability to ask questions. Help us to ask the right questions. Help us to know, as our starting place, the unequaled love that you have for each of us and all of us. From there, may we live our lives differently. May we be those who reflect your compassion and love through the work that we do and the lives that we lead. In Jesus' name we pray.